I'll just jump right in. I think you all have gotten some background information on my research uh, uh, background as well as, as my clinical background. I'm the Director of Research and Innovation at the Mindfulness Center at Brown and also an Associate Professor in um, both the Behavioral and Social Sciences as well as uh, Psychiatry in the Schools of Public Health and the Alpert Medical School. Uh, and as was mentioned, I'm going to try to keep the the talking portion of this uh, evening very short because it's it's evening time, at least on the East Coast, uh, and I'm sure many people are zoomed out uh, these days. So we'll try to keep the presentation part just to give you uh, enough information uh, so that we can actually have a, a more of an intimate discussion afterwards with Q and A. And what I'd like to cover is many of you um, suggested topics or, or voted on. Uh, topic. So I'll try to cover anxiety. I'll try to cover uh, how that fits with uncertainty. Um, some folks had asked about procrastination as well as balancing uh, work and, and home, especially when work is at home for many of us. So uh, why don't we just jump right in. Uh, just first, my financial disclosures. Basically, these are all managed by uh, Brown University. I'll mention some of the apps that my lab uh, is studying uh, that are covered by this. Actually, I think more importantly than this is, um, you know, as you can see, I'm a white male. And many of you may be familiar with uh, a lot of concepts that are still being taught in medical school around uh, a lack of racial sensitivity, to put it mildly, but I think uh, at extreme even um, racist concepts that are still being taught in medical school. For example, there's a PNAS paper uh, published in, in 2016 showing that 50% of medical school students and residents still believe that black people had thicker skin than white people and had a higher pain tolerance. Both of these are not true, um, and this actually affects their clinical decision making. So I'd really encourage folks, uh, I found it uh, very, very helpful to educate myself around things like this. Um, I found this podcast series, Seeing White, some of you may be familiar with it. It's out of Duke University. Fabulous, really helpful um, and interesting podcast. And then there are tons of books out there. One, for example, is Deep Diversity. Another book that I just read recently called My Grandmother's Hands by Russ Mominicum. Uh, so many resources. I think this is, this is really important for all of us to keep in mind, uh, especially uh, in today's climate. So I thought I would start with uh, just a clinical vignette, a patient that I've been caring for in my clinic at, uh, at Butler Hospital. This patient was referred to me for anxiety. Uh, and in fact, when he walked in the door of my office, I could tell that he was pretty anxious. In fact, he met all the criteria for both panic disorder as well as generalized anxiety disorder. And as he put it, um, one of his big issues was driving. Uh, he found that uh, he would start to get these thoughts in his head when he was driving on the highway where he felt like he was in a speeding bullet. And those thoughts proliferated to the point where he was struggling driving on the highway. And in fact, just driving a couple of miles to my office on that day for his initial clinic visit uh, was very anxiety provoking for him. The other thing I noticed um, about him was that he was about 180 pounds uh, overweight. Uh, and so, you know, we were, we were going to start by working with his anxiety, but I bring this up because uh, many folks, whether it really doesn't matter what your specialty is, uh, you're going you're gonna to work with patients who are, um, or probably already are working with patients who are anxious, as well as folks who are overweight and sometimes uh, have these, these comorbidities. So what do we learn in, in medical school about how to work with um, these types of things, you know? Um, I actually didn't learn a whole lot in medical school about how to work with anxiety. And even um, in residency training, you know, I was taught about SSRIs and just prescribing these things, although the efficacy isn't particularly great. Uh, so, you know, and, and with, with obesity, you know, many of us learn this formula, calories out versus calories in. You, know, you make sure you eat salad instead of cake, you're going to lose weight. Now, that, that formula is accurate, uh, though from a clinical perspective, uh, isn't actually that helpful for helping, at least helping my patients pragmatically change their behaviors. Uh, this is even true, you know, I can think of this in terms of how I started learning to, to meditate. I would try to force myself to pay attention during silent meditation retreats and found it extremely challenging. And what this points out, whether it's trying to learn to meditate or be mindful trying to lose weight, trying to work with anxiety, is that, um, you know, as, as Einstein put it, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness 
that created it. And I think we're very focused on, um, you know, this heuristic of willpower and, and force and, you know, just do itness. Uh, but in fact, this doesn't fit very well with how our brains work. Um, and in fact, you know, we're relying on a part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, which is thought to be the seat of self-control. This is actually the youngest and the weakest part of the brain from an evolutionary perspective. What I would suggest is, you know, we don't really pay attention to how our brains work. And if we paid a little more attention, we might understand this. Uh, and this could actually illuminate a lot in everything from helping us help our patients, uh, whether it's they're struggling with, with habits, to helping ourselves, um, whether we're struggling with anxiety, whether we're struggling with uncertainty and whatnot. And in fact, in, in today's climate, there's a unique confluence of uncertainty that actually can lead to anxiety. So I'm gonna show you a, a short animation um, that, that my team put together based on a, a New York Times op-ed that I wrote, uh, I think back in March, uh, when this whole thing started exploding, uh, to kind of highlight how some of this works. Anxiety Gone Viral, Why Fear and Uncertainty Spread Anxiety Through Social Contagion, and How to Protect Yourself. Anxiety is a strange beast. As a psychiatrist, I've learned that anxiety and its close cousin panic are both born from fear. As a behavioral neuroscientist, I know that fear's main evolutionary function is helping us survive. In fact, fear is the oldest survival mechanism we've got. Fear helps us learn to avoid dangerous situations in the future through a process called negative reinforcement. For example, if we step out into a busy street, turn our head and see a car coming right at us, we instinctively jump back onto the safety of the sidewalk. Evolution made this really simple for us. So simple that we only need three elements in situations like this to learn. An environmental cue, a behavior, and a result. In this case, walking up to a busy street cues us to look both ways before crossing. The result of not getting killed helps us remember to repeat the action again in the future. Sometime in the last million years, humans evolved a new layer on top of our more primitive survival brain, called the prefrontal cortex. Involved in creativity and planning, the prefrontal cortex helps us think and plan for the future. It predicts what will happen in the future based on past experience. If we don't have enough information, our prefrontal cortex lays out different scenarios about what might happen next and guesses which will be most likely. It does this by running simulations based on previous events that are most similar. Enter anxiety. Anxiety is defined as a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. Anxiety comes up when our prefrontal cortices don't have enough information to accurately predict the future. We saw this with the novel coronavirus that was discovered in China at the end of 2019, COVID-19. Scientists raced to study the characteristics of any new virus so that we can know precisely how contagious and deadly it is and act accordingly. Uncertainty abounds. Without accurate information, it is easy for our brains to spin stories of fear and dread. In addition to being fueled by uncertainty, anxiety is also contagious. In psychology, the spread of emotion from one person to another is termed social contagion. Our own anxiety can be cued or triggered simply by talking to someone else who is anxious. Their fearful words are like a sneeze landing directly on our brain, emotionally infecting our prefrontal cortex and sending it out of control as it worries about everything from whether our family members will get sick to how our jobs will be affected. Wall Street is a great example of social contagion. We watched the stock market spike and crash, the stock indices being a thermometer for how feverish our collective anxiety is at any one moment. Wall Street even has something known as the Fear Index, which with coronavirus outstripped the financial meltdown of 2008. When we can't control our anxiety, that emotional fever spikes into panic. Panic is defined as sudden, uncontrollable fear or anxiety, often causing wildly unthinking behavior. Overwhelmed by uncertainty and fear of the future, the rational thinking parts of our brains go offline when we're panicked. 
Logically, we know that we don't need a six month supply of toilet paper, but when we see someone else's cart piled high, their anxiety infects us and we go into survival mode. So how do we not panic? Too many times I've seen my anxious clinic patients try to suppress or think themselves out of anxiety. Unfortunately, both willpower and reasoning rely on the prefrontal cortex, which isn't available at these critical moments. Instead, I start by teaching them how their brain works, so that they can see how uncertainty weakens the brain's abilities to deal with stress, priming it for anxiety when fear hits. But this is only the first step. To hack our brains and break the anxiety cycle, we need to become aware of two things. One, that we are getting anxious or panicking, and two, what the result is. This helps us see if our behavior is actually helping us survive, or in fact moving us in the opposite direction. Panic can lead to impulsive behaviors that are dangerous, and anxiety has near and long-term consequences both mentally and physically. Once we are aware of how unrewarding anxiety is, we can then deliberately bring in the bigger, better offer. Since our brains will choose more rewarding behaviors simply because they feel better, we can practice replacing old habitual behaviors such as worry with those that are naturally more rewarding. These are the bigger, better offers. For example, if we notice that we have a habit of touching our face, we can be on the lookout for when we act out that behavior. At that moment, we can step back and notice if we're starting to worry. Oh no, I touched my face. Maybe I'll catch something. And instead of panicking, we can take a deep breath and ask ourselves, when was the last time I cleaned my hands? Just by taking a moment to pause and ask the question, we give our prefrontal cortex a chance to come back online and do what it does best. Think, oh right, I just washed my hands. Here we can leverage certainty. If we've just washed our hands and haven't been out in public, the likelihood that we're going to get sick is pretty low. The more we can see the positive feeling and effects of good hygiene and compare them to the negative feeling of uncertainty or getting caught up in anxiety, the more our brains naturally move toward the former. Because it feels better, they naturally choose the bigger, better offer. How do I know this? My lab has studied these mechanisms for decades. We've recently found that simple mindfulness training delivered through an app called Unwinding Anxiety can reduce anxiety by 57% in a study that we did with anxious physicians. In a second study with people with generalized anxiety disorder, we saw that anxiety went down by 63% in just a couple of months. Understanding these simple learning mechanisms will help all of us keep calm and carry on, which is how London dealt with the uncertainty of constant air raids in World War II. As we keep calm and carry on, this helps us keep from getting caught in anxiety or panic whenever we face uncertainty. When our prefrontal cortex comes back online, we can compare anxiety to what it feels like to be calm. To our brains, it's a no-brainer. It simply takes a little practice so that the bigger, better offer becomes our new habit. So anxiety gone. Just to sum that up, um, you know, we can see how you know, these old survival systems of the brain uh, involve the limbic system uh, can actually be very helpful. Fear learning is helpful for learning, helping us survive. Yet this thinking and planning part of the brain, which also helps us survive, uh, tends to go offline when we get stressed out. Now, what we can do is we can start to leverage and in, in leverage this old part of the brain, the stronger, uh, more, uh, I would say, more, um, more reliable part of the brain by just understanding how it works. And as I pointed out in that video, you know, reward-based learning actually only has three key elements a trigger, a behavior, and a reward. And this is actually set up to help us remember where food is. If we're hungry, we go and forage, we find that food. And then this, our stomach sends this dopamine signal to our brain that says, remember what you ate and where you found it. And when we do this, we can actually start to uh, learn to remember where food is. We use the same learning mechanism to avoid danger. And in fact, this learning mechanism is so strong, it's been shown to be evolutionarily conserved all the way back to the sea slug. Eric Hendel got the Nobel Prize in 2000, uh, showing that sea slugs learn the same, through the same mechanism as humans. Now, interestingly, anxiety itself can get formed 
through this same type of reward-based learning system. So I'll show you a short animation on how this works. Did you know that feeling anxious can actually be a habit? Yes, that's right. We all feel stressed and anxious at times. Some of us get more anxious than others, and for many of us, it feels crippling. We can get caught up in endless worry habit loops. But how is this a habit? Millions of years ago, when making babies, eating, and trying not to get eaten were our full-time jobs, our minds developed a very important survival tool. Using food as an example, it goes something like this. We see some food that looks good, our brain says calories, survival, and we eat the food. It tastes good and as a reward, our brain tells us we actually feel good. Because it feels good, our brain says to us, remember what you ate and where you found it. This plays over and over in our minds. We get hungry, trigger, we seek out that food, behavior, and we feel good, reward. Simple, right? When stress or anxiety is the trigger, our brain starts trying to figure out what to do. That's the behavior. And if we happen to come up with a solution, we get the reward of feeling less anxious. This behavior only has to happen a few times before our brain gets in the habit of trying it every time we're stressed or anxious. But how often do we come up with a solution that fixes the problem? Pulling out our smartphone and checking our newsfeed or answering a few emails might give some brief relief, but this just creates a new habit. <laughs> if I'm stressed or anxious, I should distract myself. And when the distraction doesn't work, our minds go back to trying to come up with another solution. We start worrying about what to do, and that worry thinking ah. becomes its own trigger as we tighten down into a tiny little ball of anxiety. Not much of a reward, is it? So even though it doesn't work, our old brain keeps trying. The good news. So I'll just pause that there, uh, just to highlight a really important point here. This, this is research going back to the 1980s, um, showing that you know unpleasant emotions or thoughts can actually trigger worry thinking as a mental behavior, which uh, makes us feel like in, we're in control. You know, if we're if we are uncertain about the future, at least we're worrying, making us feeling like feel like we're actually doing something about it. The problem is that our brains quickly figure out that this is not that rewarding so that the worry thinking becomes its own trigger and, it, and we start spiraling out of control uh, into anxiety leading to more worry, leading to more anxiety. Now importantly, once we understand how these mechanisms work, we can actually start to work with them. And this is where a lot of the research that my lab uh, does comes in. You know, uh, This is around mindfulness training. So how does, how does mindfulness actually work? You can think of mindfulness as bringing awareness to the present moment and helping us see when we are reactively um, or even habitually acting out uh, some of these old habit loops, whether they're positively or negatively reinforced. Just to give you a couple of examples, uh, we've even done studies with anxious uh, physicians. So for example, and I probably don't need to tell you all this, um, you know, we did a study at UMass a couple of years ago where we found that 60% of uh, physicians who were screened for this study I had moderate to severe anxiety. Unfortunately, this was the easiest study I'd ever recruited for. It took a single email from the CEO to get uh, more than enough subjects for this, for this study. In fact, about half of these folks said that they felt burnt out about um, a few times a week, and a quarter of them said they felt this way daily. Uh, also, about a third of them said they felt that they had become more callous toward people uh, since they took their job. Uh, so we, we did a study just to see if mindfulness training could help uh, with anxious anxiety in physicians, and we threw in a couple of burnout questions to see how uh, this affected burnout as well. And what we did was we delivered uh, mindfulness through an app because uh, it helped decrease barriers for entry. People could do this on their own time. Um, they could get these short modules that they could um, use to understand how their minds work and understand how mindfulness works, uh, 10 minutes of training a day. We could introduce animations to help uh, keep people engaged and, and drive home some of the key concepts. And importantly, we could do in the moment exercises. So people, you know, as you know, if they were um, between patients and feeling anxious, they could take 30 seconds to do a mindfulness practice to help um, ground themselves before they uh, went to the next exam room or whatnot. 
And we could also embed experience sampling so we could track efficacy, um, uh, track progress and also test uh, efficacy to see how well uh, these things worked. So long story short, we did a couple of studies. The first one uh, with, with anxious physicians was a relatively small pilot study just to see if there was a signal. We used the GAD7 uh, as a clinically validated anxiety tool. We found that we could get a 57% reduction in anxiety at three months. This was interesting. Um, there was a signal there, but we needed to do a, an RCT to see if this was actually true uh, compared to a, a comparison group. So we replicated this in, uh, in patients with generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, here we saw 63% reduction in anxiety at two months, so uh, largely the same magnitude of an effect. Uh, with people with generalized anxiety disorder compared to uh, treatment as usual. Now we did see a reduction in the uh, folks that got usual clinical care, about 15% reduction in anxiety uh, relative to baseline, but that uh, really was not as uh, great of a magnitude as we saw in the folks that uh, had the addition of mindfulness training. And uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the number needed to treat, I think of this as the um, you know, quick and dirty way of, of testing to get a sense for, you know, how efficacious the treatment is. For example, uh, the number needed to treat for the use of antidepressants, which is gold standard medication for anxiety is about 5.15, meaning you need to treat about five people to have an effect in one person. Uh, in this study, we found that the number needed to treat was, was only 1.6. Um, interestingly, in our anxiety uh, study for, with physicians, we also saw a 50% reduction in certain aspects of burnout because we found a strong correlation between things like callousness and anxiety. Um, those are individual factors, and when, when you reduce anxiety, people can learn to work with callousness as well. We also saw a reduction in some of the institutional factors, but not to the same magnitude. So, for example, emotional exhaustion went down by about 20%. But as you can imagine, an app isn't going to fix institutional <laughs> processes and, and problems that might be there uh, that are underlying uh, emotional exhaustion. Uh, so, you know, what, what this suggests is that if we, you know, if we actually understand mechanistically, you know, what, uh, what underlies uh, some of these problems around anxiety, for example, negatively reinforced behavior, we can use mindfulness training to specifically target those and, and get an effect. And in fact, we've done other studies, I won't go into it now in the interest of time, but we've done studies with app-based mindfulness training for smoking, we've done this for emotional eating. And what these all share is this core underlying mechanism of negative reinforcement. So these negative emotions will trigger certain behaviors like eating or worrying or smoking. And um, these, these behaviors can actually lead to a temporary relief so that they get reinforced. And you can see how this applies to uh, checking our social media feeds or watching Netflix uh, as a way to procrastinate from, uh, from certain behaviors and, and whatnot. Now, the way, uh, so if we're going to actually target this specifically, one of the core aspects of mindfulness training is, uh, is really this attitude of curiosity. So here I turn to my muse, uh, Lewis Carroll, who wrote in Alice in Wonderland, you know, how Alice, Alice exclaims, curiouser and curiouser. And what this suggests, and, and what I would suggest, is mindfulness training specifically substitutes some of these external behaviors like smoking or watching Netflix or whatever for something that's internal, something that's always available, like curiosity. And in fact, this curiosity can provide a sustained relief because it's not something that becomes habituated because it's, it's not something external to us. It's something that we always have. I'll give you an example of this. Somebody uh, using our anxiety program uh, reported that she said, when I first started using a program, I didn't quite buy into the benefits of curiosity. Today, I felt a wave of panic and instead of immediate dread or fear, my automatic response was, hmm, that's interesting. So she tapped into her curiosity. She said, you know, that took the wind right out of its sails. I wasn't just saying it was interesting. I actually felt it. Uh, I was so thrilled. So just to bring uh, this, this part of, the, of the, uh, the informational part of the talk to the end, um, you know, how did my patients with anxiety do? You know, we came in full-blown panic disorder, full-blown generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, in his first visit, I sat him down. We actually mapped out some of his old habit loops around anxiety. You know, for example, he would have a thought, um, you know, about driving on the highway which would lead his uh, behavior to be avoiding, you know, he'd avoid driving. And then res the result was that he could avoid those negative emotions, those negative thoughts, but in fact, it was hindering his life. 
Uh, so I sent him home to start mapping out some of these habit loops. He came back two weeks later and sat down in the chair uh, and he was really excited to tell me something. I said, you know, so what's going on? And I was expecting him to tell me how he was starting to learn to work with anxiety. And in fact, he said, yeah, I've mapped out some of these habit loops, but I lost 14 pounds. And I was kind of stunned by that because I wasn't planning on addressing uh, his eating issues. But he said, you know, as I mapped this out, uh, I was stress eating as a way to cope with my anxiety, but I realized that it wasn't actually helping me. Over the course of the next six months, he went on to lose about 100 pounds. And in fact, he had, uh, he had um, a fatty liver, he had hypertension, he had um, uh, some pretty severe obstructive sleep apnea, and all of those resolved. Um, his, uh, his steatohepatitis was, had resolved, his blood pressure was back to normal, and um, in his, uh, his apnea uh, went away. Um, now, you know, that was all from him learning to work with his mind. But even more interesting than that, uh, this was, um, I was, I was teaching a class, uh, I think it was in the fall semester uh, at the School of Public Health, and I walked out onto the, onto the courtyard uh, next to the School of Public Health on South Main Street. This car pulls up, and the guy rolls down his window, and it's my patient. I look at him, I'm a little confused, you know, because I, I wasn't sure how much he was driving at that point. He's, he gave me this big smile, and he said, yeah, I'm an Uber driver now. Um, so here's an example of somebody, you know, who's learned how their mind works so well that not only was he able to uh, work with his anxiety, um, but he was also able to work with all of these resultant complications uh, that, would, that had led to weight gain and hypertension, et cetera, et cetera. So the bottom line here is that there's actually quite a bit that's known about, you know, how our minds work. And if we can actually start to pay attention to how our own minds work, we can, you know, just, I'm just using uh, some common behaviors as examples, but as we learn to work with them, uh, specifically, if we can target uh, these, these habitual behaviors, uh, we can bring in things like awareness to help us, uh, help us step out of them and also step into new habits of, you know, for example, being curious or being open to new experiences, et cetera. So what I'll do is I will, um, I'll stop there and, and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions. And in particular, we can dive into some specific issues. I know folks had asked questions around how does this relate to, uh, to procrastination? How does this relate to, to balancing work and home? So uh, why don't we start with you know, whatever questions are live for you all, and I'd be happy to uh, address some of these other specific issues uh, as well. Um, and I'll just end by saying we've got a bunch of, of resources um, at the Mindfulness Center, I've got um, a bunch of these uh, educational videos on my, on my website. I actually have a free CME course that you can get CME credits through Brown uh, that teach you more about uh, habit loop formation and, and some of the research around mindfulness if you're interested. So you can uh, just check those out uh, if, you'd, if you'd like to learn more. So I will stop that part now and would be happy to uh, dive into some of these questions. Okay, Dr. Brewer, can you hear me with the questions? I can. Okay, great. Um, can you please tell us what role imagination plays in the development of anxieties and how it reinforces anxieties? Imagination, oh, that's a great question. Uh, so I think, of, <laughs> you know, I think of imagination being a double-edged sword. So we can have this creative imagination that can help us you know, see things that we haven't seen before. And at the same time, our imagination can run away if, if, um, if anxiety and worry uh, kind of take us by the hair and start yanking us along. So here, um, you know, we can think of, uh, of imagination playing a role in, in anxiety when, you know, our, our uh, planning and thinking brain is trying to plan for the future. And we imagine, oh, this scenario or this scenario or this scenario, and we start worrying about it. You know, it's like, oh no, oh no, this could happen. Oh no, this could happen. Oh no, this could happen. So as we start to um, pay attention to those, we can see how that imagination can spiral out into worry and even panic, uh, as compared to when we can step back and pay careful attention, where we can see imagination opening us up to be in our in our uh, move out of our comfort zone, move into our growth zones so that we can start to see new horizons, new opportunities, and new ways to work with things that we haven't worked uh, with before. So hopefully that, that answers, or at least gives, gives folks something to work with with regard to that question. 
Terrific, thank you. Um, one of our attendees works with youth who face many triggers that lead to anxiety. Can you speak to this and how can they best address support their, uh, these youth or their patients? Yeah, it's a great question. So there are, uh, so generally speaking, I would say um, many of these things relate to some type of habit loop that gets that gets formed to the point where it's causing trouble. Otherwise, the youth is is not needing to come in for treatment. So here, generally speaking, if we can help folks start to identify habit loops around whatever the the disruptive behavior is. Um, you know, what's the trigger, what's that behavior, and what's the result of that behavior, the more they can tap into, you know, how rewarding or unrewarding that behavior is, uh, the better they'll be at being able to work with it. I'll just use a, a, an example. Uh, so, for example, with overeating, uh, we've done studies with helping people pay attention to what it's like when they overeat. So, if, if there's a youth, for example, that stress eats, or is, 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 is eating beyond um, you know, satiety and, and taking in too many calories, uh, we can help people pay attention to what it's like to actually overeat and bring mindfulness practices in to really specifically pay attention and see when they're actually full, when they are content as compared to when they're habitually overeating or when they're stress eating. And what my lab has found is that the reward value in the brain actually drops significantly as we pay attention because that reward value, uh, they start to see very clearly that it's not as rewarding as it used to be. This is called a, a, a negative prediction error in, in scientific terms, where you know, our brain is predicting that it's going to be certain, you know, have a certain type of reward. And when we pay attention, we see that it's not that rewarding. So there's a negative error there. They're expecting it to be certain, and it's not as rewarding as they thought. And it only takes 10 to 15 times of people paying attention here, paying attention to those specific behaviors, that that, um, that negative prediction error kicks in and reduces that reward value to the point where they'll actually shift behavior from overeating to not overeating. And so there, and that this can be applied across any, anything that, that uh, falls into that negative reinforcement or even positive reinforcement schedule. Great. Um, I think somewhat maybe on the flip side, what are some of the survival techniques you suggest for physicians who are dealing with their patients' anxieties on a daily, if not hourly basis? And have there been any good sci uh, studies um, of impact of patient anxiety on physicians? You know, that's a really good question. I don't know of any specific studies. So I'm thinking here of, of emotional contagion, right? Uh, as we talked about um, you know, uh, this emotional contagion is, is more infectious than physical contagion because you can physically limit yourself from getting a, a virus. But, you know, if you go on social media or you sit in an exam room with an anxious patient, uh, it's pretty e easy to walk out of that exam room and, and kind of have picked up that anxiety ourselves. So the key here is being able to recognize um, when, you know, when we're starting to get emotionally infected with, by somebody and I think, obviously I'm biased, but I think mindfulness can play a big role here where we can start to recognize, okay, here's anxiety, here's what it feels like to take on somebody's anxiety. And we can also learn to be able to um, be with that anxiety and not take it on itself. I think this is the difference between empathy and compassion. I actually write, I wrote a whole chapter about this uh, in my book um, on uh, called The Craving Mind, where uh, with highlighting um, physician burnout as part of this because you know there's this real phenomenon of empathy fatigue where we put ourselves in our patient's shoes and if they're suffering we're suffering i think this is also true for social contagion where if they're anxious we're more likely to get anxious but there's a difference between empathy and compassion where we you know compassio literally means to be with suffering so as we can learn to be with somebody's suffering but not take it personally we can be with that, whether it's anxiety, whether it's fear, whether it's panic or whatever, we can learn to be with that in a way that's, that's empathetic in the sense that we're understanding where they're coming from, but not in one where we're catching that, that social contagion. And in that way, uh, we, we um, kind of provide this, this, uh, this um, you know, immunization uh, from getting infected with other people's anxiety. And at the same time, we still maintain this capacity, this, this, um, this uh, natural urge to help, 
which is that other side of compassion. You know, in the face of suffering, we are naturally moved to help. Now, if we're suffering ourselves or we're burned out, it's much harder to actually help somebody else. But if we can shift from empathy to compassion, um, and a lot of the, you know, a lot of mindfulness training has been shown to increase this ability to shift this. There's a JAMA article published over 10 years ago out of the University of Rochester. We're just teaching primary care physicians some of these basic mindfulness practices that help them, you know, to de develop this ability to be compassionate, but also not be burnt out. Um, I think this, this goes a long way in helping us help our anxious patients, but not uh, get anxious and also not get burnt out as a result. Thank you. Um, we do have a couple of questions surrounding mindfulness, which I'll get to in a minute. But since we're all living amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, we've got a couple of specific questions regarding that situation. With so much uncertainty uh, regarding the pandemic, how might one balance the coping strategies of patients anxious about contracting the virus, including so social is isolation, with getting back out into society safely when the pandemic improves or when a vaccine becomes available? Yeah, this is a really good question. So I think there are two parts here. Um, one is, is helping our patients keep their prefrontal cortices online. You know, if we can help people um, be able to take in information, that's gonna be really critical, um, not only now with whatever information is available, but also helping people take in information as new information becomes available. So it's really critical to help patients be able to ground in reality. Some of this, um, you know, our brains are, when there's uncertainty, there's this natural movement to find information because information is food for our brains. So uh, it's helpful to help explain to our patients, you know, you, you might be feeling this urge to get more information, but going on social media is not necessarily gonna get you good or accurate information or even up-to-date information, you know, like, you, you go on social media and the same stuff is replayed over and over and over and over. We can actually get in the habit of checking news feeds, for example, because, you know, you go on news and then, you know, one in every 20 times or whatever that we go on, um, on our news feeds, some, some new piece of information, you know, hits. And that's just like uh, slot machines. You know, you pull the lever and you don't know when you're going to win. But we do know that that's the most reinforcing uh, type of schedule in all of neuroscience. You know, that, that intermittent reinforcement gets us coming back for more. So I think just educating our patients around how we can get addicted to, for example, news feeds in trying to get information and how that actually can make us more anxious. Because as we go on there, we're just reading all this negative news that's saying, you know, worry about that. This is terrible. That's horrible. That, you know, those things don't help. So if we can help people learn about that, we can help them kind of moderate their news feeds with doing simple things like don't check the news before you go to bed, don't check the news first thing in the morning, maybe you limit yourself to checking the news once or twice a day. That helps them keep their prefrontal cortices online so that they can then follow um, good you know, social and public health measures like wearing a mask, uh, social distancing, all the things that we actually know. And that can also help people feel more confident that they can be safe out in public um, you know, by following these measures rather than freaking out and either sequestering themselves at home where, um, you know, where they're, you know, they're actually building up their, their fear and their worry of to actually go outside and then not taking care of themselves, whether it's doing essential duties or whatnot, um, but can also help people uh, model this behavior for others so that we can spread this, uh, this type of healthy behavior through social contagion. Um, the other piece is, you know, really uh, emphasizing and even modeling um, good healthy behaviors, like making sure that we get enough sleep, making sure that we're eating healthy food, all these things that we know intellectually, but often don't feel like we have time to practice ourselves. I uh, hear, you know, the, the, the words physician heal thyself uh, comes to mind, whereas we need to make sure we're grounded so we can actually model as well as kind of exude that type of social contagion where we can show that we're grounded. We are, you know, we can keep our thinking brains online. And then when our patients say, well, you, you, you seem calm, what do you do? We can say, well, I, you know, I exercise every day. I, I eat healthy. I make sure I get enough sleep. You know, maybe I do some meditation and prayer in the morning, whatever it is that we do to make sure that we are nourished and that we are grounded so that we can actually uh, model that behavior for our patients as well. And I think those two things uh, go hand in hand. 
Terrific. Well, I think we have about time for one more question. Um, we'll get into mindfulness a little bit because there have been several questions surrounding that. Um, do you have any tips to motivate patients to participate in mindfulness when you don't have a lot of time to spend with them and many of them seem to want to uh, go the route of medications or marijuana and are not interested in putting in the work? Um, and how quickly could someone see benefits from mindfulness? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So here, what I do is I really try to find common ground with folks and I've never, never found a patient who's not interested in learning how their own mind works. And so here, if there's a, you know, if there's a, a troublesome behavior, like, um, you know, turning to marijuana, for example, um, if somebody's turning to marijuana to calm themselves, what I would do is, is help that patient start to map out, you know, what's the habit loop that's leading to them leaning toward, you know, th that behavior. And then here we can bring in very, very simple uh, motivational interviewing tech practices like, okay, so you're smoking marijuana to calm down. Why don't you smoke more? And what that does is it kind of rubs people's faces in that behavior in a, in a kind way that helps them start to see the, the negative results of those types of behavior. So maybe it costs money or they, um, you know, they feel, you know, they, they struggle at work the next day or they feel groggy or they feel, you know, they feel a little paranoid, you know, lots of, lots of negative effects that can, that can come from things like that. Or I've had tons of patients who've come in and who, the, who will drink, you know, they'll drink more than, than they, than is healthy for them, um, which these days is just about any, you know, as the data are showing, you're, there's really not that, not any level of healthy drinking, um, but they'll drink and then they'll say, you know, I get a hangover or it's expensive or, or I'm gaining weight. And, and I help them see those behaviors uh, pretty clearly so they can map that out. And when they see that clearly, it, it actually increases their motivation to start to work with it. Whether it's a you know whether it's a one of these negative coping strategies or anything else, and when that in, that motivation increases, then I can give them you know as I showed in this, this video that bigger better offer. So I can say you know if you just tried um, a simple mindfulness practice like um, paying attention to your breath for three breaths you know in the middle of when you're starting to feel stressed out, how does that you know how does that feel for you? Um, we actually have a free app uh, called Breathe by Dr. Judd that actually gives people um, these short mindfulness practices that they can bring to those moments. And there's actually a breathing exercise in there that they can use. So I give them, you know, something that they can do for 30 seconds um, that, that, that can actually help them work with stress and anxiety right in the moment. And in a way that doesn't cost money, doesn't, you know, uh, doesn't cause other problems for them. And then they can see, okay, here's something that's actually available to me. That's not that hard to do that. I don't have to put a big commitment into, you know, here's a free app that I can even learn this stuff from. And that can actually start them down the path of some of these uh, healthier, more sustainable behaviors as compared to, you know, something that might lead to long-term, long-term and even short-term uh, negative consequences. So thank you for joining us tonight. We hope you found Dr. Brewer's presentation helpful. Thank you so much for your time this evening and uh, have a great night. Thank you, Dr. Brewer. Thank you.